Okay, and we're live, and that was the millennial pause that I just gave, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, not even millennial, but I have the millennial pause. So I guess, I don't know, welcome everybody to first official stream, or welcome whoever's here uh, at the start of the bell. Um, but yeah, this is exciting. So uh, JT Russell here with quick draw 3457 or do you say 3457 or something 3457 i think is what how i would if if i were going to say it out loud that's how i would say it excellent excellent so we've we've talked about doing a podcast or a stream regularly record regularly for a long time now so it's exciting that here we are kind of kind of doing it um, Dude, we finally we finally did it we finally took the step and hopefully <laughs> there's people that are going to enjoy this absolutely absolutely so you know, uh, I don't know. Pilots always, uh, always awkward and sloppy. <laughs> we'll, we'll be no exception, but we'll uh, we'll put together something pretty cool here, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, well, let's jump right in. So, I guess format. I guess format was kind of your brainchild. So I don't know if you want to want to kind of talk. Well, us through I think it. it was. I would see see it as a group effort. But I I think the way we talked a lot about what we wanted to do. Um, I very much wanted to kind of like fit in with the brand of sloppy lab work and kind of like get into analysis and, and kind of in some ways um, a not too deep science of it. You know, like I don't I didn't want it to just be uh, very, you know, um, topical. I, I wanted it to kind of talk about strategy as well and talk about different experimental things that we could do differently. Um, and so as we talked about a lot of the things we wanted to have in like the podcast that you mentioned, there was just so many other topics that we felt like we could go back and forth on this kind of stuff for a long time. And those were all like really good things we kept notes on and said, let's add this in there. And then, you know, we had all this list of great topics we could talk about. And I was like, let's, you know, try to tie that into a game as well. And so I think what we're going to try to do each week is we'll have this topic that we want to talk about that we're both interested in, both have some input on that hopefully you guys maybe haven't already heard a thousand times, try to add something new. And then we're going to play a game or two after that kind of um, as a representative of that topic. And um, so we'll get into that more about what, that, what that's going to mean for today. But um, I would always expect, you know, like a good conversation, hopefully something new, and then followed by a game where you can kind of apply you know, that kind of debate back and forth and, and kind of see it in action. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like this format a lot. I think there's going to be a lot of good, uh, good content, good gameplay coming out of it. Uh, hopefully, with any luck, we'll at least turn the first, the first bit, the discussion bit, into something that's kind of consumable via audio only. So that's a goal. Um, but yeah, look for that too. See where when that drops. And today, kind of going with that format, we have a really kind of apropos, uh, kind of very relevant relevant theme slash game to uh, kick things off. So we're going to be doing sort of our origin story and also uh, playing some Newton games or a Newton match, I guess you'd say. And that is particularly relevant because uh, our origins are very much steeped in the Newton format. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't even know who invented the format, but um, originally we played it for the first time in the Time Shapers League a couple seasons ago, which you have, I believe, up on the screen right now. Um, was this league? This this was kind of like where a lot of this started. Um, and now in stereo and I, um, who we've been playing and talking strategy for probably years now, which is crazy to think of this game. But he and I have always had like just a back and forth DM where we play games all the time and talk strategy all the time and. Um, we got to this tournament and he and I had like a very friendly rivalry in this tournament and he ended up winning it as you can see on the screen there and first I, I came in third and then you were sandwiched right in the middle um, and so it started with just kind of stereo and I and then you had the sloppy lab work you had the site you had a lot of things you're working on with your brother um, really cool stuff and so I think it came to be was it the swindle team event I think where there mm -hmm. was a Newton format and it was a Team Newton, which was like a very slight twist on it, but I thought it was really cool, uh, very appropriate, I think, for a team format. And uh, I said to Stereo, I was like, you know, it would be really cool if we could get JT Russell and we could kind of point back to this uh, this round robin here where we finished one, two, three. Like, I was kind of like, let's do it. Let's, you know, let's try to get like the top three Newton players from the Time Shapers League and see if we can see if we can take down this league. And you uh, you agreed. And so I think that was kind of where it started. Yeah, and it was it was a lot of fun. I I couldn't agree more that uh, Newton is a great a great team format. Um, and I I know we'll get into this too, but I I actually really like Newton just in general. Um, so was happy to do well in that uh, in that event. Really happy to kind of join up with the both of you for the Swindle event. And yeah, team's been 
growing sense, I guess you'd say. <laughs> well, a segue to that is, you know, about who else we have on the team. And uh, when we took you, so to speak, we stole you for mm -hmm. that team uh, event, a single team event. Um, one of our other current teammates, not tonight, uh, I think was a little upset with now is Sarah and I, because <laughs> she was she was definitely planning on swiping you for that event. And we uh, we kind of just went in there and, and took you away. And the timing, the timing worked out well. So there was that front, which actually uh, was a reversal where we kind of scooped her up afterwards and, uh, and kind, of, uh, kind of lined up with my brother being very busy. Usually I do the Time, Sacher, Time Shapers events with him. Um, so I found myself, yeah, without any teammates and, and you all were looking for the third and we kind of had the super team, super team already identified by the previous event. Uh, so it worked out really well and kind of was the seed was the seed for sloppy lab work the team uh the team after that um so that's really cool yeah uh not tonight i had played with a, a fair bit before though much more since um i i really started uh i guess following her around i, I guess you could say in uh, the time shapers sas cap uh league they back in the day there was a time shapers weekly sas cap which was a lot of fun and she was invariably in the finals and I was invariably trying to <laughs> trying to like claw my way up for a game with her. Um, and we had a lot of, a lot of fun back and forth kind of in those events, uh, seeing who'd come on top week to week. And I think, I don't know if you can find those, um, those standings anywhere. I should have dug them up. Um, but Aurora kept a, a weekly log and a leaderboard for those, for those SASCAP events. Um, and we kind of ended up once the dust settled one and two, so it was really fun. Um, but a lot of good back and forth, a lot of great games and really loved playing with, uh, with not tonight. Um, so I don't know, it, I was, uh, really excited afterwards. So she was, I guess our, f our fifth official member of the team. So there was the three of us and your brother. And then, and then we kind of were like, well, can't just have the other T Russell uh, <laughs> looking in from the yep. sidelines. So we brought him in yep. and, uh, and then not tonight, shortly after, um, and both very strong players, both awesome additions. Um, and then I think actually JDG 314 yep. was the next. And yeah, so we had five and we needed another swindle team event team and you can't have it with five. So we were like, we need to get a sixth. Mm -hmm. And we, we luckily got JDG in the team. He came in as the sixth. Um, so we had two full teams then, and for that event, that was actually before we were like officially sloppy lab work. We were still kind of working on the identity crisis, but obviously we had to play into the <laughs> evil twin part of it. Uh, so we were Curiosaurus, and then the evil twin of Curiosaurus, um, just because I mean Curiosaurus was like now in stereo and eyes, like our favorite card. We just I don't know. I I wasn't very creative, so like whenever I kind of like put us together, I was like, all right, we're just gonna call this this Curiosaurus for the time being, and so. We needed the uh, like the creativity to come in before <laughs> we became sloppy lab work. And I, I mean, the uh, the sloppy lab work heads out there will will appreciate the trivia. Our our team server is still curious source themed. <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was a condition from now in stereo. It had to it had to remain with that image of of curious source on our server. It's it's dear to our heart. I love it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, and then most recently, um, we've mm -hmm. added Crusader as well, who's uh, another Polish player um, who's been really awesome to play with. Um, casual games. We haven't really teamed up, I don't think, in like a, a bigger event. I think he was in the ABR league with us, mm -hmm. um, the, the sealed one that came up. We each had two teams of three. Um, but, yeah, he's been awesome to have in. And I, I got to play a few games with him and do some audio calls and hang out with him there. And a lot of fun, really good games, smart guy. So um, mm -hmm. very happy with the state of our team. Yeah, very strong players up and down the board. Uh, JDG is someone that I played with, um, not this past ABR, but the one before. Um, so kind of knew that they were they were a real strong player too and real real good teammate. And yeah, we just have kind of overall great dynamic. Couldn't be happier. Seven. We'll see if seven ends up being an upward number. I think right now it feels like a good kind of a good number. And uh, you know, you, you maybe you want things to come in threes, but more often than not someone's going to want to take a break for for a rotation and and it's nice to have not feel like you have to go to bat go to bat each time you know <laughs> yeah and, and this is a, a total credit to like the people that run time shapers and abr and uh, like the uh, nordic league and all these other ones 
we always kind of like half joke about how there's too many legs right now, which is amazing to think about, you know, like this is a game that's supposed to be on hiatus and we're all just like, oh my God, I'm like always playing high competitive league games like every single week. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not bad having seven because you are going to sometimes want like a break from, from competitive leagues for at least a couple weeks. And so it's nice to have that, that extra number in there to, to give us that chance. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So let's, let's talk some Newton. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we kind of, uh, hit on the high notes for, for this event, uh, and kind of how it segued into us forming this team. So, uh, got our kind of got a roster out there. I don't know uh, anything that we want to you want to touch on first. Maybe maybe um, strategy wise, how you went about selecting decks. Maybe the decks that you played in this league in particular. Yeah, we let's get to that in a second. Actually, the first thing that mm -hmm. I think I thought, and probably a lot of people thought when the Newton format was proposed, is like, oh my god, there's a tie. Like, you know, ties just sounded so so bad but i actually think that's like a very crucial component to the format and what makes it so good and it's because you can't just bring decks that are like always going to win or always going to lose and it forces you to find something in the middle ground that you know can win but also you can beat it and i think just the fact that you have that tie like you're taking you're, you're playing adaptive best of three but without the third game right and if you had that third game then like all bets are off you could just bring a you know, like it, you do an adaptive, you can just bring a high power deck and you can plan on winning the first game, losing the second game, and then knowing the proper chain bid in the third. So it doesn't really incentivize you to bring a lower powered deck, but this format with the tie, I think specifically with the tie, I really feel opens the, the deck choice up to a level where anyone who's playing this game will have a deck in that level that would fit right in with what I would expect the meta to be for a Newton event. Um, and like the metas that we've experienced, I think in Newton have been slightly different, um, like between the Time Shapers League and then the uh, Swindle Team event. Um, maybe we can talk on that in a little bit. But I, I really think that um, it's so important to me to have like a, this middle range of of decks that you can play where you don't have to spend a ton of money. Like literally any deck you find is could be a good Newton deck. I think if you know it well enough and it has like enough intricacies to it where you know, it's something that you're not going to look at it, know right away how to play it or how to play against it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you kind of contrast with adaptive, which there are no ties, right? And in, in regular best of three adaptive. Uh, and I think you have a lot of overlap in terms of what makes a good deck for the respective format, with the exception that adaptive has this kind of extra incentive to play stronger decks, I, I would argue, right? You want to maybe be going first in game three to mitigate some of the chains you maybe you want to be bidding on your own deck so you kind of have information on uh on the deck that's being bid on um and and i think newton really hones in on kind of that that middle ground like you were saying decks that can be beaten decks with weaknesses you can exploit decks that aren't kind of monsters um and and yeah absolutely and that's one of the reasons why i love it i think Ties are actually, I think, a very healthy thing for Keyforge. I mean, if you bring an awesome, really powerful deck and I bring something that's kind of middle of the road, I mean, there might not be a really great way for us to kind of get at uh, a decisive result that's kind of skill-driven, right? I mean, you start layering on chains and layering on chains and eventually you get to a point where, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's more variance dictating the result than necessarily skill. Certainly there's skill going to be in finding the right chain balance and maybe it's an even match kind of with respect to luck of the draw, but but it, it might be not necessarily so skill driven anymore in kind of the result, uh, how you're driving to yeah. the result. I, I am a big fan of adaptive, um, but I hear that complaint a lot. It's like, well, when you, when you get into the game three and there's a lot of chains involved, it does kind of increase the variance. I think it makes it better than, you know, just playing like a, high saz monster that's like so good versus like a middle of the road deck like you used as an example like it's a more fair game than that but there still is variance involved it's not like a perfect mm -hmm. um you know it's not a perfect calculation but part of the formats that we've played with newton like the time shippers was a round robin with 16 players and you played 15 games that was it like that large number of games i think adds to the sample size and makes it like perfectly acceptable to have ties like 
you had the uh, the standings up from the Newton League, and if you if you just kind of like browse through the standings, you'll see like a lot of the records. There's a lot of ties in there, but there's enough games where you know seven wins and two losses for now in stereo was like huge, you know, um, and mm -hmm. it was it was I think easily the most wins anyone had. Uh, and then the second time we played it was a team event, which is also another wrinkle that doesn't really care as much about ties. Like we had a tiebreaker in that one where you would, um, I think it was just a random Archon or reversal single game, choose one of your players, play one of your decks. And um, I think that was adequate. Like, I think that was fine. Um, but when you're playing in a team event with three games, you're more likely that uh, one of them is going to result in a win and maybe two of them result in ties. Um, I think it was somewhat rare that you had like a win on each side and then a tie um, just because the format is, you know, it's pretty, pretty geared towards ties, but that's okay. And I think for a team format for round Robin, I think it's, it's perfectly good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, looking at some of the, the top finishes here, or even, even just across the board, not even top finishes, most folks are hovering right around a third, a third of the games, a third of these Newton matches being, uh, being, uh, ending in a victory, right? A 2-0 win. So you, yeah, seven wins for now in stereo. A little bit of an outlier. The next, the next handful have have a five, five out of the fifteen, um, and that feels that feels about right for a three-person team event. Um, and then just having a, having an extra tiebreaker to decide things because you know, maybe this is great for a round robin for a bracket for a bracket style event. You're gonna need you're gonna need to figure out who's gonna advance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were good safeguards in place for that. So I thought it was, I thought it was really nice. Um, I brought us on that kind of tangent about ties and, and whatnot, but you were asking me about like, how do I pick a deck for it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's also, I think, pretty interesting. And, and as I was thinking all day about what deck I was going to play against you tonight, I just like kept running into like, well, what about this? What about this? And I think um, the first time we did a Newton League, um, I think Aurora shared like a bench line deck, a benchmark deck, as she called it, like, here's like roughly what people will be bringing and i didn't particularly like that you were like we were nudging people towards this kind of deck because you look at a deck like that and you're not really sure like okay is this the benchmark in terms of like all the eric values is this the benchmark in terms of the saz like this one doesn't have artifact control does that mean i shouldn't bring artifact control um i'm not usually someone to say like saz is a very important number but for me personally when i'm looking for a newton deck i still actually will focus more on like hovering around a 70 SAS mark mm -hmm. than I will like any other specific stat with the deck. Like to me, 70 is like a sweet spot where you can win with it. You can lose with it. Um, but to me, like the more important thing is finding strategies in that deck that are more than just like two card combos or more than just something that's like on the surface where you see like, okay, this has zero Amber control. So like either player can see that and kind of like immediately know that it has nothing or it has very little, um, so I like to look a little bit deeper than that, like very like unique aspects of it that you have to not necessarily know in advance, but be able to pick up on it and um, take advantage of it. And sometimes you don't really get to see that after one play with it or one play of your opponents with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting too that that 70 was kind of right around the mark where you settled on. I'd say that's pretty accurate for myself as well, maybe a little bit lower. Um, uh, with that still being kind of around the 87th percentile, so still on a grand scheme, uh, fairly high. Uh, though I think we're maybe conditioned to think 70 is like very, very middle of the road. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But well, the other part was that the Swindle team event, we saw people were bringing like mm -hmm. 75 to 80, sometimes higher than 80 SAS decks to that event. And some of them did really well with them because they, they were tricky decks. And I think that meta for that event was like geared slightly higher in power. And I, I don't, don't necessarily know why I can't really explain that, but um, it helped that whole strategy work of like bringing a complex 80 SAS, 85 SAS deck and having it work out. The time shapers event was a lot lower than that. It was, yep. that's where I think I got my original baseline was about a 70. Yeah. So I think there are, I think there are kind of a couple of factors going in there. And one of these I have to credit not tonight for, and, and that's really, you know, most folks are, going to bring the decks that they know best to formats that um, that reward you for knowing your deck well. And that's typically going to be the ones that you jam for Archon matches, right? So you go into the Swindle event, and, and another big difference, <clears throat> excuse me, between the Swindle and Time Shapers event, the Time Shapers event, um, 
this, this league allowed you to, to switch your deck each round. So each game you got to choose a different game and we a different uh, deck. And we really saw kind of the meta hone in as the league progressed. Whereas on the Swindle side, it was, I think, for this particular one, you register initially and, and you played that deck throughout. Um, so maybe if maybe if there were some deck switching allowed, we would have seen the meta really hone in. Um, but uh, I think initially we maybe we maybe saw a bias towards the decks that folks really had a lot of reps with. Yeah, I think the other part that was really unique about this was uh, in Time Shapers, uh, I'm rereading this description. It says an odd round plays Archon first and then reversal. Mm -hmm. Even rounds, you switch, you play reversal first and then Archon. So the format, like this was like the first Newton event that I remember ever happening. And so no one really knew like what it was going into it or what to expect. So like being able to change your decks every round, I think was hugely beneficial just for learning and experimenting and trying different things and add on top of that the wrinkle of archon first or reversal first and um like how did that affect your decision making with what deck you brought <laughs> yeah great question uh, it ended up affecting my decision making a lot for the time shapers event and i'm not sure if it should have affected it quite as much <laughs> as it ended up but um i had two decks that i really uh swap between so i played uh, this one, Denizag, Utopia Spirit Caller, um, most often in the Archon first events. And then I played Deirdre Events Rook most often in the Reversal first events, or first matches. Um, and my thinking really was that I wanted decks which had non-obvious weaknesses in the Archon first match. So I, I would not showcase the weakness in the Archon game. And then after we switched, I'd be able to exploit it and in the reversal first um, uh, games, I'd want a deck that had sort of non-obvious strengths, so I could, you know, maybe exploit an obvious weakness and then and then play the powerful line that might have been um, less less clear less clearly presented on an initial read through uh, in the Archon game. Uh, so that was my thinking. Uh, what ended up happening was all of my wins. So I had five wins across the event came from Denizag, <laughs> so they. Were, yeah, every win that I that I achieved was with Danazag and Deirdre. Actually, um, Deirdre actually drew an awful lot, even against decks that were rated much much higher. Um, so perhaps the perhaps the hidden strengths in Deirdre were not as hidden as I was hoping. <laughs> so, do you think that um, do you think Deirdre was too weak of a deck for the format, or do you think it was? So interestingly, Deirdre went two zero. Uh, so Deirdre picked up wins uh, even against much stronger decks. And I think looking back, I think it was maybe just too swingy of a deck and and happened to have upswings frequently <laughs> over the course of yeah. those games. Um, you know, you said you only played it for two different matches? I played it for the majority of the reversal first matches. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. And it picked up, it picked yeah. up a lot of 2-0 wins. And, uh, you know, looking at it, especially at the time, Maybe maybe less so now, but Epic Quest gets poo pooed a lot. The Epic Quest line in this deck is very potent, um, but there is there is some the deck will reward you for knowing when to abandon it and when to really pursue it. Um, but it does have this uh, you know triple lab work Eureka Hex Beyond you know archive all the things, then unload your Sanctum, use Martyr's End to clean up your board, you know. That's, a, that's a great point you made about like knowing when to abandon a certain mm -hmm. obvious strategy. I think that's a really crucial aspect of this format. Because um, you don't want a deck who's like, okay, clearly this deck is going to be an epic quest, and that's the only way it's going to win. Mm -hmm. Like, There's a lot of decks, I think, that are like that, and you can't bring a deck like that. This deck can win with or without it, and you need to know when you can win without it and just kind of stop leaning into it. I think that's a huge part of of the whole format and like knowing when to lean into something and when to say, you know, nope, I can't do that. Um, if you actually uh, bring up Guadalupe, which was mm -hmm. my, once I started to get my feet under myself in this format, I brought Guadalupe more and I, I don't think I made a comeback per se, but like I was, um, I was able to get most of my wins in the event using Guadalupe, uh, the periodically spiky. And it has um, similar things to like what you're talking about. Like it has a data forge line in it uh, with a final analysis that could, that could do some damage. Um, but it didn't really ever arc or archive enough to pull that off unless you had the Hydra Catalogger out and you were playing against a deck that was fighting with the Tide. Mm -hmm. So 
kind of early on, if I didn't think they were going to fight over the tide with me, if they were just going to let me have it, I probably am not going to archive enough cards to be able to feasibly pull off a data forge. So then you have to think about your archiving strategy with like the EDs and with the Novu and things like that. Like you, you're not going to archive uh, cards that you want to stick around forever. You might look at archiving like all of your untamed creatures to use with the Chelonia or something like that. Um, so you have to be able to recognize those kind of things on the fly during the game. Um, but this deck, like to me, I, this is like a good representative of what I look for with um, with a Newton deck. And it has like so many little intricacies to it. It's not like, I don't want to look for a combo. I don't want to look for um, something that has like, you know, just like one little aspect to it. That's like, once you figure that out, it clicks. Mm -hmm. This one, this deck is like every single turn, you feel like every decision you make is going to change the game. And even now I've played probably like almost 100 games with it, which for me is quite a lot. I, I tend to be a player that like spreads around, plays a lot of different things, but 100 games with this deck for me. And like, I still feel that I punt like a quarter of my decisions that I make with this deck. And, and like also conversely, my opponents playing against it have those same kind of like crazy decisions they have to think about and make against a deck like this because one little thing like can can keep shifting it back and forth like the tide warp in here and it just goes back and forth a lot and it's about kind of like who's able to maximize their value who's able to make the fewest mistakes and it's just it can be frustrating when you're playing a deck and you're just like oh i can't believe i just like blew that so hard like i you know you have old for device out and you call logos when you know that you need to take them off check the next turn after that and the only thing you have to take them off check besides logos is like a single valmar and maybe a mookling and that's like almost it uh maybe a xeno training and that's it so you really have to plan your turns multiple turns in advance and like that kind of complexity i think is just beautiful for this format yeah absolutely i uh I'm sure we'll get lots of dark tidings love from you over the course of uh, our, yeah. our our conversations. We have like we had so many lists of things that we wanted to talk about on this this podcast slash stream, and like most of them for me are about like why I love dark tidings so much. So yeah, that's so, going to be a recurring theme. I'll probably talk about it a lot. Yeah, so hot takes we can foreshadow uh, before we. I know yeah. we're coming up on a half an hour mark, and we want to switch gears to playing the game. But hot takes we can foreshadow. We do, yeah. I'm a fan of the Tide mechanic. I'm going to fight for it. Uh, so well, we'll get to that at some point. And I do think there are good adaptive decks out there. I know there's some strong proponents of folks who say all decks are equal for adaptive, but I intend to argue that point too. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. I think there are definitely good ones, and I think there are definitely better ones. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that may be as good a time as any. I don't know if there's anything else you want to touch on before we switch gears. Um. No, I think we're at almost half an hour. I was going to pull up uh, one of the other decks that I unsuccessfully played during the Newton League in Time Shapers. Sure. Because you were talking about like which deck you played always for Reversal First and which one's always Archon. I had a deck that's like this Uber OTK combo deck where I think a lot of the Coda fans would see it, um, but it's still not exactly easy to, to recognize right away. Um, and I was like, oh, I should play that for the Reversal First. And then... Um, they won't know. They'll just play it like as a regular value deck, and then I will try to pull off this weird game where I don't reap or play any pips, and I just archive everything, and then play the library access, phase shift, battle fleet, key abduction, reverse time, and forge three keys in a turn. Mm -hmm. And the few times that I played it in this format, um, I think one of them I actually lost O2. My opponent just played the cards for value and beat me, <laughs> and I had my library of the damned, which is like a pretty key card here. Um, stuck at the bottom and I, and I never pivoted in time so it's like I had this idea that like oh yeah this seems like it'd be great to play reversal first and then it kind of just like completely backfired on me isn't it interesting too how you can have these decks that you've play, gotten so many reps with I think I'd put Russell the magician in that in that camp and I'm sure we'll we'll see that deck at some point um, it's my kind of go-to adaptive deck at the moment but I, I think I feel like I've identified the best way to play it in a vacuum but there are still matchups that come up where that way is not the right way to play it for that matchup and my opponent punishes me for trying to force it or trying to like yeah. like not 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 being able to adapt kind of in the moment um so yeah. I don't know, a testament for to sure. how deep the game is really for sure yeah i mean i think it was now in stereo said once that to go from like zero to 50 percent in this game is like fairly easy 
going from 50 to 90 takes a little bit of time. But then like going from 90 to 95 efficiency is just like this massive gap. And there's so much at the top end of this game that when you first start playing it, you're not going to really recognize like how much more skill there is involved than you think. And that little tiny bit at the end makes such a huge difference, but it's so hard to like to get there and understand the game on that level. It's got just tons of depth to it that I don't think it gets credit for from the like the wider gaming community. Mm-hmm. Right on, right on, right on. I think we're preaching to the choir in this audience. Probably. Yeah, we, we may be, but it's a, it's a point worth hammering. All right, so I'm going to hop over to the Crucible. Want to play a game? Let's play Let's a game. Play a match. This will be our, this is, on the record, this is the official match for the league. So um, I guess you could say that there's a lot on the line here, maybe? There, uh, There's something on the line. There's at least uh, some league points on the line, at least. <laughs> Have you played any league games yet for this? I played one, but it's been expunged, uh, and I have to play the, the new substitute. Um, okay. But our, our yeah, I, I, yeah, I was just. No, I played one game so far. It was a tie. That was all. So I, I will say too, our pod, well, the league as a whole is just stacked, and I guess it's really hard to find any any events these days where it's not just stacked top to bottom. But holy moly, yeah. lots of great players out there. Yeah. yeah. You and I and Aurora in this one, and then Algernon R, who is the current Kagi finalist, mm-hmm. and um, I, I, the fifth one's escaping me at the moment, Karen. Karen Brown. I mean, like, come on, like, this this pod is nuts. Um, Bananas. We were in the same pod for Kagi. You and I were last season. It was you and me, and now in stereo, mm-hmm. and I think Aurora. So it's just like, yeah, every every event you play nowadays online, it's just like, can I get a break? And like, not get a <laughs> get, get an, in a an pod. Easy round. That everyone's amazing. <laughs> yeah. But then you look at like the other pods and like, oh, I guess they're all stacked right now. Yeah. Yeah. They really are. Hey. 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 Welcome all the chat folks. Appreciate you all coming out. Uh, how would folks how would folks prefer? You want hands revealed? No hands revealed? Any preference? I like the drama of not seeing hands. You'll all see mine anyway, but I don't know if anybody I, wants I also, to hop in. When I'm watching games or when I'm watching streams, um, I guess particularly with like a commentator with two other people, mm-hmm. I strongly prefer to not see hands. I, I love the surprise factor. Um, and I, I love just focusing on like what the board is and, and then you have like that long pause and you think about it. But maybe it'll be different for for you. I'm gonna shut the, the chat off now, obviously, in case you do have your hand. I guess you'll have your hand open no matter what. But um yeah, I don't know if anyone else in the chat has thoughts on what they like to see hands. Well they have told you I you select a deck <laughs> to uh to make up their mind. But uh yeah. I, I told you that I I um, struggled all day thinking about what deck to play. This is the one I landed on. So, um, I'm kind of glad I did, actually, that I, I landed on this one because it'll be pretty relevant to a lot of stuff we talked about. So okay. we'll talk about that after. Very cool. Very cool. All right, kicking it off. So you are up first. Good luck. Have fun. Good luck. P-O-H-F. Opa Cat, the Herder Minstrel. Yeah. I, uh, I, I chose this deck... Well, not only for the reasons that you mentioned, but also because it sounds a lot like Copycat, and that uh, really makes me happy. <laughs> All right. So, y- you and I have like our go-to decks, and we already know them. So mm-hmm. I'm like, kind of like surprised. Like, wait a minute, I've never heard of this deck. Before. <laughs> like, thought I knew all the decks that you liked, and here's a new one already. I have far too many decks. Far too many decks. Yeah. Well, I I'm starting to like try to make a rule for myself about having too many. Um, because yeah, there's there's so many that I want to play. Like I mentioned earlier, that I just I'm the kind of guy that likes to play a lot of different things as opposed to like a thousand games with one. Mm-hmm. And I'm struggling to to play everything that I want to play that I have in my collection right now. Yep, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Okay, taking a look through what we got here. This is spicy. Dane, I've seen Dane before. You have, yeah. I couldn't resist picking something that you'd already seen. Mm-hmm. Always, yeah. Always tricky finding decks to play teammates with. Yeah. Oof. I like this, though. I like this start. Well, I'm going to send mine back. All right. Okay, Seaborg. Hmm. Hopefully get that tie going. Yeah. Oof. Well, 
well, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I always struggle with the, I, I usually will not mulligan if I go second. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that is awkward. Um, it's just so hard to me like to throw away a hand of six knowing that I could get a hand of five that is worse. Um, so it's just, to me, I, I, I will be more lenient with myself if I'm going second to just keep a hand that I don't necessarily like. Mm -hmm. Oh, very right, fair. Let's get, some, let's get some science. It's very appropriate for the sloppy lab work. Yes, indeed. All right. Pretty nice. Oof. Archive some more, huh? Oh, my goodness. That's beautiful. I love it. Dang. Very spicy. Um, yeah, it was a... Hmm. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us. Wow. Let us not look too silly on stream. Hmm. Don't love, I don't love. This the cat hand. does seem a little, little awkward. It can be. Um, your Seaborg is really, really cramping my style. I'm not gonna lie. Mm. Interesting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I'm gonna go dis. And I'm gonna chomp, quant. Play this guy. And pass. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. He's just strong enough to survive then. Yep. Yep. All right. Let's uh, go for the fish. And this is very exciting here. <laughs> take that, take that scallion right back. I was oh, worried I, there was I, bubbles course, coming. Indeed. Of course. For forgot to uh, play my Thundertow first. So I'll pay for that one later. Mm -hmm. And then the big Kraken. Too bad I cannot keep the Kraken out. I love the Kraken. I've had so many decks where I can like play him with a good book or something like that. Or It's so exciting when you have a good book and you turn over a Kraken. It's yeah. like, uh, it feels so good. It's like one <laughs> of the greatest feelings in this game, I think. Mm hmm. Oh, this is sad. Let us go. Eesh, eesh. Really awkward. Hmm. Okay, Star Alliance. Let's get the lay of the land. Some of those are not surprises. Yeesh. Hmm. Let's get this one down. Play it here and there. Yeah, I was feeling really good about Kin Can initially, and the Seaborg, Seaborg made it so uh, awkward. Um, yeah, well, um, I think Kin Can's gonna survive here. If that makes you happy, marginally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got Logos and Dis, so um, you won't be able to steal one if I keep Buzzo out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yep. Yep, and of course now Seaborg can steal the tide with Buzzle if it really wants to. Let's see here. Don't want you to have the Lang. Lang could be good. Good way to get yourself back in the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Call it a void. And let's play some more fish. So many fish. Awkward. Oof. Getting scary, getting scary. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see what we can do with logos. I'm gonna archive some cards. That's a lot of archives. It is. Archive those three and then throw down a quant. Innocent quant. Never hurt anybody. Right. Mm hmm. Key already. Now What's going on? <laughs> play the cards in hand or use the board. Age old question. Mm hmm. I'm tempted to just play the board. I'll let you call Mars if you want to. I can't legally call Mars. There's no whirlpool. I mean, we'll, we'll manual it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very nice of you. Yeah. Let's just keep keep going with the fish then, I think. See if I need to kill anyone here. Um, I don't want to kill Buzzle because you'll probably steal one then. But um, I think killing the Quant is not a bad idea. And just reap. Very solid. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay, let's go into this. We will take the archives. Find that hysteria. Yeah, you know, I had I had the hysteria to begin with. Um, it's just so good with the quant, especially, and uh, when you can have the Igors. Not that I'm, uh, uh, not that I should be giving you these uh, tips, right? But <laughs> free tips. Yeah. Free tips. Uh, so let's kill a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, Kill this one as well. That's a pretty good pseudo board wipe there, I'd say. Yeah, not great use out of the hysteria. Probably not worth holding for as long as I did. Um, but in the interest yeah. of science, oh, you hit the Francis. Such a shame. Poor Francis. Poor Francis. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was between uh, that well. and uh, letting Hysteria pick back up the Millie for you to unload your fish. I don't know. Tough call. I already got the Tide, so the Cement Shoes doesn't do a ton, but... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not bad. Going into Star Alliance. A sad red alert. <laughs> I'm going to play Explore Rover and an upgrade on Explore on the non -buzzle, uh, bubbles target. <laughs> Fight reap. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just gonna go back into shadows here. Trickle down. Great, great card. Mm -hmm. Very and nice. Enrage the scullion. Blue. Uh, and let's check you. That is nice. Mm hmm. Hmm. Not a ton of amber control you have, obviously. It looks like, if I'm reading correctly, quadricorder and rot grub. 
might be two of the only things that can take me off. Oh, I guess there's the information exchange too. Yep. All right, so let's go Logos. Let's steal one. Use those, give you f free and clear path. Right. Mm -hmm. Could just keep going with shadows here. It's not bad, not bad. Fight Bruno into the old scullion. Seems like a good plan. <laughs> and then uh, that'll trigger my my trickle down. So sure, why not? Yeah. Should do that, right? Yeah. All right. I think I just gotta just keep using the board. Seems legit. Borrows for nothing. Mm -hmm. Happy to see both of those cutthroats go. Makes it a little bit easier on me. Yeah, I debated uh, debated keeping some around. Um, don't know. No, I mean that's not something I would hold. But. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into Star Alliance. Let's play Chan with an encounter suit. We're going to reap and stun Willa and then play a stealth mode. OK, cool. Wow, joke's on you. Uh -oh. These actions. Let's see the creatures. Bring them out. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, my game plan uh, this time around could be boiled down to keep you off trickle down theory. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good strategy. It's yeah. a great card. If I can't use it all game, then I mean, it, you clearly must be doing something right. Mm-hmm. All right. I think um, I think it's fair to take the archive here and not play into the data forge too much. You can have the tide, though. Thank you. Mm-hmm. There's the chronophage. Very nice. Yeah, make you answer it at least. Yep. Um. Yeah, tough call in the archive. All right, that seems fine. Okay. All right, interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very nice. All right, we're going this. Let's play a Gleeful Mayhem. This disc creature. Logos creature, this shadows creature, and the warded dude. We're gonna fight into the chronophage. And unload a couple more guys. Okay. Trickle down theory activated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Uh, interesting here. This is, this is one of the things I like most about this deck, actually, is being able to do this. And that is keep he you off said check. ominously. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, just the trickle down gets so much better if you can actually have ways of taking them off check. Mm -hmm. And this does. Um, so I have to make make sure I use it before I get you down. Mm -hmm. so, uh, deal one with walk the plank. Deal another with walk the plank. And I think we'll take the chain to steal one with sea urchin. Ooh, very nice. Okay, that makes things awkward for me. I guess there's no question about house then. We are going to see some star lines. Poisonous sea urchin is really annoying. Oh, it's, yeah, it's actually one thing I, I didn't know about the evil sea urchin until recently is that the evil one doesn't have poison. Right. And that sometimes can make a difference. Yeah, um, absolutely. I always was like, oh, the evil is just objectively better. But, well, there's some times when you don't mind having a one-power poison. All right. I'm going to hope that Chan is hard for you to deal with. Put the translator on Explore Rover. Let's see. There's Chan. Yes. So let's reap with Chan. Reap with Adarone. To blow up the Eddy. Willis still has Elusive. That's kind of annoying. But I'm going to say thank you to the Skirmish on Explore Rover. Gobble up the Searchin. Stun Willa. And. Ooh, good question. Wormhole Technician, or I think we archive the Rot Grub. Give ourselves a little insurance. Not bad. So. So you're going to have three of them there, plus the rot grub, so I'm going to need ten most likely. Don't think I'll get there. Or will I? Or will you? Yeah, yeah let's just, um, <laughs> you didn't shuffle, so let's just try to push to ten. Might cost me a, a little bit in chains, but I can do it. All right, let's see. So trickle down first. Mm -hmm. Take the more. Reap to lower. And take the chains to reap again. And data forge just for the amber. Very nice. All right, so now we are on a quest, a quest to find some cutthroat research. <laughs> 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 All right, plan cutthroat research, go. Let's go Logos, take the archives. Uh, we're gonna throw down a Tau Tau. Archive a thing. Still looking for it. You got two Igors, I think. Mm-hmm. 
Ooh, tough one. Tough decision. I think I want this one, actually. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've got to find it. Oh, yeah. Find we got two. it. You got it. You get we two got of it. Them. Not two of them. Two of them really brutal. So there's that one. Although I could find the other one with the wormhole technician. That would be really cute. Oh, man. So let's roll with that. Lay of the land gets archived. Very good. We're going to get some monkey amber. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. This one, interesting. Hmm, I should have maybe, ooh, that might have been a little too greedy of me. A little too greedy of me. And now I'm gonna have to be a little cautious because of it. Yeah, that may have been a, may have been a very costly misplay, but... Okay. I don't know what it was, so it's <laughs> interesting. Um, well, that was a good turn, and if you'd have found your Logos earlier, I feel like this would have been a super tough game, but I feel like... Unless you have... No, you don't have a Walls. I feel like I should be safe here. Fairly big, unfathomable turn. Okay, let's see it. So the thunder toe here is pretty key, I think. Uh, uh -huh. The question is, what is the second one here that I'm going to get rid of? I think probably the daughter. I don't know if it matters, but let's just get rid of the daughter. And then what a great card Bubbles is. Mm -hmm. Very um, nice. Not an action. Um, just, I've always loved that card. And before I forget, trickle down. <laughs> So I'm back up to 10. 10 is pretty yeah. good. 10 is pretty good. And I don't think I can stop 10, unfortunately. Nope. Nope, nope. We can have a fun, a fun one more Logos turn, though. All right, so let's get the other cutthroat and a quant shore. Yeah. Oh wow, and the info exchange. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oof. Oof. Wow. Good game. Good game. Good game. Really good game. That's uh man, that's some wild logos turns there. So I gotta I'm looking for my logos this game, I think, is my yeah. takeaway. The logos is great. Uh can really smooth things out. The stereos obviously uh work really well. The big the big kind of misplay that I was kicking myself for is I didn't really need to reap with the one hold. That, that works too. <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna make a difference. But I'm interested to hear what it was. Oh, I think we just had the rematch break. Okay. Oh, not in the yeah, game. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not in your game. Yeah. Okay, cool. I will make a reversal game. Same password. Okay. Huh. You probably had an awesome hand, didn't you? It was. It was amazing. Doesn't that happen? Like whenever the rematch breaks, and you're like looking at your hand, and you're <laughs> so excited, and you like hit go, and you choose your house. And you play down this great card in turn one, and then you sit go, and it's like your turn <laughs> again, and you look up, and your opponent is not there. Mm -hmm. All right, and I did make reversal, I think. Yep, very good. I think you did. All right, cool. All right, good luck, good. have fun again. Good luck, have fun. Okay, I'll take it, I'll take it. Yeah. That thing I told you last game about not mulliganing, <laughs> when I go second. 
<laughs> oh man, I'm a little tempted, but I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna follow my own advice here. All right, going to logos. We're going to archive some stuff. Archiving is good. Great first turn. Um, so for like from Newton, question for you on strategy. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that the random player going first each turn is is fine for Newton? I you know I I don't mind it a ton regardless. Um, I think it's okay. Let's see. Do I? I don't see a reason. I feel though, like it, 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 yeah, why you shouldn't it, give the loser an, an option? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it was kind of nice this game that um, it was random and and Dane at our tying stack went first both times, so makes it even. But um, I don't know. I, I don't think going first or second makes a massive difference. So um, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Not not massive. I, yeah, I don't mind a ton. Um, Hmm. Mm -mm. I suppose I would err on the side of giving the uh, losing player the choice, but I don't think I would bother to remake a game if it came up with like a random on the other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty good I don't want you to have those fish get out of hand naturally my question is if I'm going to be walking into a red alert or not I think I'm just going to go for moving some cards here. Let's give you a, a good info exchange of your own on the next turn. And I am going to archive some more cards. Cool. And pass. Right. Well, um, into logos yeah go for the value cutthroat indeed igor igor code monkey <laughs> oh i hate when you play the igor and you get three awesome cards that <laughs> pop up that makes it so hard Oh man, you're gonna just like no matter what I discard here, you're gonna be like, "What are you thinking?" <laughs> mm -hmm. Anxiously watching the discard pile. <laughs> All right. Okay, discards daughter and stealth mode. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's not what I hoped for. Really interesting, huh? Well, I'm hoping that the stealth mode, kind of like last game, it, it didn't hit me that hard when you played it. And I know there's a lot of creatures in that deck, so mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have it, but um, I took the Tao Tao instead. Tao Tao is very strong. I think it's a defensible choice. I think it worked out okay for me, looking at my hand now. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to be a little greedy. Really hope. Oof. Really hope you don't have the uh, the stereo. T 
to play off Quant because that can get really out of hand really quickly. Um, but we'll see. It's a good Chrono Fage too. All right, I always have to reread it just to make sure I'm not <laughs> playing doing one something of the uh, well. yeah. Yeah, I definitely screwed that up many times. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, All right, yeah. Looks good. Melee, the red alert, lay of the land, okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yep. There's a king can and a chan. Oofa. Stunner on the Kin Can, very nice. Translator on the Chan, okay. Scary. Trying to spread the love a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to go with the fish, I think. Yep. Exhaust chan. And maybe not. Right, I got a key. Yeah. Sadly enough. Light, light the <laughs> Igor, too. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's some good plays here. Um, yeah, I, I figured you had a lot of outs to kill. The Kincan, obviously the Seaborg on table. Um, mm -hmm. This is pretty good here. Good choices here. Uh, anticipating the diss. Haven't seen the diss in a while. No, you haven't. Um, I, think, I think I might make you wait a little bit longer. <laughs> Plays Igor. Cool. Out pretty good, I think. Mm -hmm. Let's get the pressure on. Wow, Check really nice, really nice. Oof, going poorly for our hero. <laughs> this is a very different. Like we were playing game one, and I was like, I don't know how off the cat's gonna, oppy cat's gonna gonna beat this didn't feel great for me um so I'm, I'm interested to talk about our approaches after this yeah yeah for sure not that it's over i mean i i know um dane has a lot of outs and dane you have a big hand right now you have a big archive right now you could almost do a data forge <laughs> yeah um, i have the data forge i'm wondering if i i don't think it gets any better i might as well just do it um 15 16 and i can play almost it. a free key Almost. So science takes me to 14 and then bumps me back up so I can play the science first. 
Oh, that's I think huge, it, yeah. I think it works out to exactly the same. Um, it does work out to exactly the same. And then a rather unimpressive logo stern otherwise, unfortunately. <laughs> well, it's key, though. It know? is key. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a shame you didn't have the Think Twice still because yep. I think twice on the Data Forge with a science in play is really nasty. Yep. Okay. Ooh, six in archives too. Ooh. That was all the code monkey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least it's a little dirty. A couple star lines, a couple logos, even if they are very spicy. All right, take them. And all right, discs. we'll start with a gleeful mayhem. Mm-hmm. Just to get rid of the moray. Then I am going to chops the code monkey and the seaborg and the quant, but seaborg. Wow. Okay. Very cool. Throws down another puzzle. Ooh, purchase borrow. Uh, the borrow, pretty dead card. That's yeah. a good one for you to, for me to hit there. Could do that, Dexus. That's sad. Okay, left flank it is. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Wowza. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm well, well. You said you wanted to see the disc. Here it is. I take it back. <laughs> All right. I think we have to go into Unfathomable. Okay. Um, I'm going to play four creatures. You have six. You will have five. Lock those down. Ah, uh, that works out kind of well. But now, hmm. Do I want to activate the drum? Hmm. Awkward. I think I'm going to discard this guy. All right. Yep. It's not bad. It's a thing. It's a thing. Although, it's probably probably silly to guard against you going back into dis this turn. Seems really no, unlikely. No, not at all, actually. <laughs> oh, I yeah. think that was a good play. <laughs> I think it definitely makes this turn a little bit more difficult for me. The Hookmaster just feels like so much value right now, or so necessary, but we'll see. Yeah, Hookmaster's very solid. Not sure if there's much I can do about it either. There's the rock grub. Ah. All right, well, that's okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. 
Yep, just going to try to push if I can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oof. Let's go into shadows. Let's take care of one of these. Opens me up to a room, but now I'm okay with that, I think. Willa Francis. And a sea urchin. Okay, cool. All right. So you've got three shadows, three unfathomable. Any creature, your choice. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I should have set up my battle line better. Another note to talk about after. Yeah, I do have some comments on your battle lines. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's necessarily glaring errors, but it's one of the, the lessons that I've learned playing that deck about certain things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Oh, shoot. Ooh. I didn't play him. Yeah. Let's see here. I don't know if I had a good way of kind of getting around this anyway. Just because of the way my battle line set up. So. Mm. So, like we talked about last game, I don't really want to just give you infinite trickle downs. So, <laughs> best strategy is to never check you, clearly. Clearly. Always be fighting. I think that's what people say. <laughs> this is this is Magic the Gathering, after all. It's the ABF League, always be fighting. Not to be confused with the ABR <laughs> League. <laughs> So that leaves open, or that leaves Willa underneath the taunt, which is why I was struggling with this decision. So my, my misplay comes back to work out all right. I was thinking I should have left, uh, put everybody on the other flank to open up the, open up the taunt slot. Um, but interesting, okay. Interesting. Went on five. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> hmm. So let's see. You have info exchange in your discard. That's cool. Both cutthroats as well. Okay. Oh man, he's gonna burst this turn, huh? Mm, at least to a check. Yeah, let's go with shadows. Red alert's there as well, okay. Steal one. Yeah, this guy was fighting anyway. Let's just make it official. <laughs> We'll go to seven, sure. 
and throw down Bruno. Okay. All right. All right, here comes My the star favorite lines. Trick. My favorite trick is giving you the quadruple. <laughs> Nice. Okay, interesting. This one's definitely going to come down to the wire because I'm going to struggle to to build up a lot more amber again, I think. Yeah, I might, might just do that. Interesting, though. Hmm. I think. Oof. Do I want to go like this? Not getting to check feels kind of bad. Reading Chen on board feels kind of bad. Yeah. Let's give you the tie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. And this day. Uh, oof. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I can get some efficiency at least this turn. Ooh, Millie, very nice. Mm hmm. And we reshuffled. Very cool. Hmm. A wormhole tech. Oof. All right. Yikes. Yikes. Now you really fear the cut for research. Mm-hmm. I really do. Awkward. Super awkward. Almost worth giving you back the Bruno Amber. That seems terrible. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I wanted you to think when I put that quadra quarter on him. Yeah. But I think I'm going to. Ooh. All right, let's go shadows. Let's kill the chain. Let's kill the technician. Steal. Yeah, walking the cutthroat indeed. All right, let's see if I have the cutthroat. Mm -hmm. A few different options here. Not a lot. Let's try this then. Let's let's gamble some, just like you did. Okay. Oops, didn't archive. Oh well. Um, 
nothing you can do about that now, right? <laughs> Sloppy lab work. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I found it. How about Oof. that? Too good. That's that's a great Igor. Well, we're tit for tat there with that because you mm -hmm. found it with your Igor last game. Yep. I found it here. And keep you off check, which is even more important. Not often you can steal four with logos in a turn. Right. Oh, very strong. So yep, I'm going into logos as well. Not taking archives and being in the amber here. <clears throat> I'm stealing two. Oh now, man. Who do we kill? I'm worried about you going back into logos. Mm. Steal two there. Puts you at Eight key cost. Gotta reap to give you the tide back. Hmm. Should have maybe fought, but gonna push. Yeah. Right. Just enough there with Edie. All right. This is where. Let's see. Oh, got a new archive. Okay, that's something. Uh, this is this is gonna be a good one here too. Mm. Um. All right. So. Yeah, I should have taken the Kincan, I think. But really nice. Local rot grubs. Ooh, hysteria's coming. Maybe? Maybe. That's nice. Get rid of that 80 first. Mm-hmm. Anyone else I want to get rid of here? Well, I want to reap. I know that much. And... the gleeful <laughs> purge something Lacolia, okay I'll take it and the hysteria very nice two more rock grubs and just push Cool. Yeah, that's going to do it. Really nice. That's a big rush that it had there. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have anything to do about it. So what are we going to go out with? Mm, shadows. You always like to <laughs> Yeah. Got to try at least. Okay. Well played. All good right, game. good game. Uh, yeah, I didn't think that I'd be able to keep up with Dane in this game. Um, so like the thing that I, the reason I brought Dane is, um, I think it has two lines and it's like, we talked earlier in the show about like knowing when to abandon a certain strategy. And so mm -hmm. like the two that I always see with Dane are the archiving for the data forge or just putting out as many unfathomable creatures as you can and just using the board and reaping. And I, I did that first game. I, I, I had like four of them out there and I just said, just keep reaping, just keep reaping with them. Cause there's 10 of them in there, 10 creatures in that house. And I noticed that um, Oppycat doesn't really have a whole lot of creature control. There's a hysteria. There's a lot of fighting involved. And there's the red alert, if you can pull it off. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a ton. So I was just really trying to take advantage of the board when I had it in game one. Um, and then, man, Logos in this 
that can really like like you said it has all that efficiency it really makes it tick i didn't think that it would like come out as strong as it did but like the first time you played glow ghost with that huge turn i i knew that like i'd be able to hopefully find something like that this game but i didn't think i'd be able to pull this one out yeah the uh the Opicat's usually a lot more consistent uh, a lot smoother it plays a lot smoother than I, than I did the first the first one i probably to be to be candid did not pilot it as well as i as i could have i got tripped up trying to not play into the seaborg and um i think that that just cost me uh cost me too much in the first game uh had a lot of i had i think what kin can and another two power creature that I was reluctant to play into might have just been the kin can uh, or the rock rip maybe or the uh, maybe um, and uh, I think I was I was kind of just reluctant there and that that ended up biting me um, but yeah never really got off the ground um, probably what was the mistake game one that you were going to talk about oh so game one the, the mistake I made was I reaped with wormhole technician looking for cutthroat research number two um uh i had already taken you off check and on board on board you had bilge warden and um horde sign in i think either horde sign in or one of the bubbles um so just with what was on board you would have been able to fight into chan with the um with the bit or no it must have been a four power creature in logos it was a four power creature like through logos. the encounter state, you mean? yep so i think it was seaborg yeah. maybe in um maybe seaborg and bilge warden but he had the creatures to onboard to fight into break the encounter suit ward and then and then kill chan and i didn't have anything any counterplay for that so i kind of left that out there digging for cut yeah. number two yeah i definitely use that as a lesson for me to if you put the quad the quadricorder with the encounter suit mm -hmm. um which usually feels pretty safe but i thought that i would try to put it on one of your creatures that was important to you um yeah. and that ended up being the old bruno um I, I actually got the encounter suit a turn after that i was thinking about putting an encounter suit on your old bruno as on well bruno too. <laughs> um, i didn't get to that you decided to kill bruno first yeah yeah that was that was a great play um i think I do I do enjoy putting the putting the quadra coder on the opponent's creatures. I think your choice your yeah. choice was really good there. I I may have done something similar if I had if Bruno was definitely a great target for it. Um Yeah. Do you find with Opicad that you often have too many upgrades in hand cuz like when I first saw the list that was the first thing I thought like that's a lot of Star Alliance upgrades and if you're stuck with like no board um, I wonder if that ever gets kind of clunky for you. I've I've never noted that. I definitely have some decks where that happens. Twenty creatures, I'm usually usually okay, um, though not too too many in um, in Star Alliance. So it can be can be awkward, but it's not something that I've that I've stumbled on. I've let's see how many times have I played Opicat. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So that was play number thirty six, and I've I've never said to myself, yeah, there's there's too many uh, mm. upgrades in here. Um, yeah, I've had a few Star Alliance decks that were like that, and so that was my first instinct when I saw it. I think in this match, neither deck had enough creature control to really like make that a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, I Although, still felt like I had really smooth draws that second game. Like things kind of like really clicked for me. Like I had a bunch of diss all at once. I uh, had some really good. Well, yeah, one Igor I had that had to discard stealth mode and daughter i ended mm -hmm. up taking tau tau with it um but other than that i thought i had like some really nice igor opportunities um i found the, the cutthroat when i needed it later um yeah it seemed like it was pretty smooth for me that game yeah usually between the the star alliance is uh, does does help out but between the discs and the logos i mean hysteria does so much work with the rock rubs the buzzles can can thin things out for you too um and if you ever get to connect a quant with the hysteria like you did, uh, it can just get really nutty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that for sure it did. It got really nutty with the Igors and taking him back and the Code Monkey twice in a turn was, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really mm -hmm. solid. Very solid and usually fairly consistent. Um, 
Yeah, the dis I think I think is underrated. Sass puts that at eighteen for the house, the weakest house among the three. Certainly the logos is the star of the deck, but um dis role plays pretty well. I think Buzzle tends to go underrated and you got a lot of value out of it. Um Yeah, he's he's definitely two. a tricky one to play though. Like I I'm not used to purging as much as I did with him. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it worked really well for me, like, when I used it. Um, once was, like, right before the Hysteria, so, like, all those creatures didn't really matter. Um, another time, I think, was um, just purging all of my discs when I knew that I had no discs left in my deck and I wasn't going to call them again for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that turned out pretty nice. Yeah, worked worked really well. Um yeah, well piloted. Well piloted indeed. Let's see. Yeah, playing, good match. Good game. And yeah, playing Dane. I think I, there were a few times where I noticed that I was tripping up my my battle line, primarily with around the taunt uh, protection mm -hmm. that I was using up. Yep, um, that's exactly the the tricky part to me too. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I felt it was so important for me to get rid of the Seabringer when I did. Um, I used a. I think I used a draining touch on one. If I'm not mistaken, and then I fought off the other one with the Scullion. Um, I always try to leave a Seabringer on a flank. Um, I never surround it with fish on both sides because I always want to put preferably Chronophage next to it, um, but also Edie. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like the big thing that I always try to think of with those. But um, that's like a thing with, with um, Dark Tidings that another thing that I love about it so much is that for once the battle line like really matters. You know, like it's not just these taunts in here which is, you know, in other sets too, but there's so many things that you have to think about with your battle line and the order, and um, it just adds this excellent layer of complexity and depth to me that I, I really appreciate with the set too. Yeah, Gua and Guadalupe's a great example of that because you've got, what, the infighting and techno babbles, so you're kind of forcing yeah. folks to juggle a couple of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, you just try to force errors with it. Um, like, if they have to play around one, it's kind of difficult to play around both of them at the same time, and so... Um, yeah, it's there's so many cards like that. Um, Grand Melee is another one of my favorites. Um, you know, there's just really cool stuff. The one thing that I really am disappointed in with Dark Tidings is that he, they didn't bring back uh, the Star Alliance creature, um, Tactical Officer Moon. Mm -hmm. I thought Moon would just fit so well in Dark Tidings with a lot of the battle line stuff. I wonder why they didn't do that. Because um, that was, I mean, previously was a fairly underwhelming card. Um, and it just really would have fit so well in the set. So, yeah, like Moon would have been great. I mean, I'm surprised. Like Finger Trap would have been excellent too. Um, would have been very interesting and less less directly relevant with some of the uh, some of the houses. So more of like a long term planning, um, but playing yeah. into the same things. Definitely. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, we are uh, a little over over time that we expected, but that was worth <laughs> it. That was a lot of fun. Really good match. Good talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. Good times. Thanks for folks for coming out. Uh, I'll try and do better next time. What can you say? You get the first one we're on the inaugural up. stream. <laughs> we're living up to the name. It's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So all the sloppiness was on purpose. Absolutely. It's all, just our brand. All intentional. <laughs> Staying on brand. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I guess I don't know. Good night, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody.